America in a troubled world, what does the future hold? Now, let's begin by uh, uh, turning to uh, Luke chapter 12. Because in Luke chapter 12, it's interesting, Jesus is not talking about the United States, <laughs> just to be clear. Though it's applicable, right? You know, all scripture is, uh, is God-breathed and useful, and, and it's going to be useful for us here. But in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 54, the crowds are around him, and the disciples are within that crowd, and, and Jesus is, says something difficult to them. He was saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, hey, it's going to be a hot day. And it turns out that way. And then Jesus says, you hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? At the core of what he was saying was that the Hebrew prophets had given us a list of prophecies, of data points that would indicate who the Messiah would be. And those who were standing right in front of him who ought to know those prophecies and be able to connect the dots, to use a term in Washington over the last you know, decade or so since 9-11, to connect these dots, they weren't doing it. The personification of truth was standing right in front of them. And they knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem Ephrata from Micah. They knew he would do ministry in the Galilee. That's from Isaiah. They knew he would be, uh, 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 that a child would be born, a son would be given, a human being, a male human being would come to earth and lo and behold, he would be called mighty God, Isaiah chapter nine. Uh, they knew a lot of details, but they weren't able to add it up. The first coming of the Messiah to earth. Now, What's interesting is that, of course, the scriptures, both uh, the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures, give us more details about what's coming when, as we prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, let me be clear right up front that while we're going to be analyzing this present time, certainly tonight and through this weekend, I want to be clear that I don't know when Jesus is coming back. You know, I'm not a modern Nostradamus. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a clairvoyant. I don't call Miss Cleo in the middle of the night to get my, you know, insights, okay? I just want to be clear. Um, I was on a radio show with, uh, with Alan Combs once. Uh, you know, Alan is Jewish and hasn't quite, you know, come into the kingdom yet, but I'm, I'm praying for him and I hope that you are. And he, uh, you know, he, my books had been out and they'd been making a bit of a, a stir and he had me on his radio show uh, to mock me. But I knew that was coming, and I, I, I wanted to be on his show anyway. So he, he said, all right, Joel, now you're the modern Nostradamus, right? I said, well, no, not really. He said, well, you wrote all those books that seem to predict these events, and so, so you seem to have the inside track on the future. I said, well, you know, it's not overstated. Oh, you're just being modest. He said, so you basically know when Jesus is coming back, don't you? I said, no, Alan, I, I, I don't. He said, oh, come on, Joel. You, just, you know, just between you and me, right, and his, you know, his, his radio audience, it's just, you know, just between you and me, you know, I mean, just tell us when, okay? And, and my, immediately what flashed to my mind was the book that's on my shelf back home in Washington, The 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming in 1988. <laughs> and I thought, I, I don't really want to go there, right? Because, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, Jesus said in, well, so that's what I said to him. I said, look, I can't tell you because I don't know, because Jesus said at the time he said it, he didn't know. He said that uh, it's, it's going to be like the days of Noah, but no one knows the day or hour. It's going to be like the days of Noah. Noah knew something bad was coming, knew God's hand was going to be, uh, was inter going to intercede in the events of humanity in a, in, a, in a cataclysmic and dramatic way, that there was going to be a way of salvation, but Noah didn't know exactly when the rain was coming. In fact, rain had never happened in the Bible thus far. So, so I said, hey, I don't know. Um, and by the way, I just should make an aside, you know, Matthew 24, right, uh, Jesus talks about the days of Noah, uh, and, and uh, my wife is here today, um, uh, Lynn Rosenberg. We've been married for 20 years. We have four sons, Caleb, Jacob, Jonah, and Noah. <laughs> 16, 14, 12, and 6. And you say, well, there's a little gap there. Why did you have a Noah? Because Jesus said he's not coming back again until the days of Noah. So we thought, you know, if we're holding him back, <laughs> 
we'd better have a Noah. And, and now he, you know, he's been around six years, and we love him, and he loves Jesus, and he just got baptized in Israel this summer, and he's already been there four times in his six years. So I just want you to, before we go any further, and I finish this anecdote about Alan Combs, we're living in the days of Noah. I just want you don't walk out of here going, I didn't know. We are. So I'm saying to Alan, listen, you know, we don't know, and the Bible didn't say, and he said, come on, Joel, let's just, you know, just between you and me, uh, is it really close? I said, well, it, it, it could be really close. I, you know, is it, is it like, should I buy green bananas? <laughs> should I bother to pick up my dry cleaning? And I said, listen, Alan, I, I know you're having fun with this. Um, <laughs> I, I really, he said, no, just tell me, tell me what I should do, Joel. Just, I, I want to be ready. You want to be ready. What should I do? You know, Jesus coming back, right? I said, you really want to know, Alan? Yes, I do. That's why I've got you on the show, Joel. Okay, well, if you really want to be ready, you need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's a very kind reaction. That wasn't his. <laughs> He's like, whoa, are you, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. You are trying to lead me to faith, and he said, convert, but lead me to Jesus on my own radio show? I said, I'm just trying to answer your question. because I didn't ask you to convert me to Jesus on my radio show. I said, you said, is Jesus coming back? I know what I said. I, you said, should I buy green bananas? I know what I said. I, I said, did, you said, should I buy, you know, get my dry cleaning? You said, what should I do? And I said, if you really, you know, figure out whether Jesus is the Messiah and then receive him. He goes, all right, I did say that, but uh, look, I don't know. So you could say, well, why did they invite you? I, I don't know. You'll have to talk to Mitch and Rich. And, and, um, but I do want to talk about the things that we do know in scriptures. And because we're supposed to understand the word of God, and then we're supposed to understand the world events that we live in, and we're supposed to analyze the present time. Jesus was actually fairly harsh, uh, saying we were hypocrites if we wouldn't do that. And that's really the purpose of the conference. Now, in the book Epicenter, my nonfiction book, the first one, I wrote about three lenses that uh, if we only look at events in the world, and particularly in the Middle East, through uh, po geopolitical lenses or economic lenses, we can't really see in three dimensions. Only if we look at the world also through what I call the third lens, the lens of Scripture, do things begin to become a little clear. Doesn't mean you're, you're going to understand or I'm going to understand every event that's coming in every part of the world at, at all times, but we're going to understand things better when we understand things from the perspective of the Scriptures. And, and so I want to look at the Scriptures on this big question of America in a troubled world, what does the future hold? Now, let's look, let's look at several references that I think can apply to the United States that are, that are in the positive, okay? Let's start with Revelation uh, chapter 7. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, uh, verses 9 and 10. Uh, the Apostle John is writing in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he says this, Revelation 7, beginning in verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. When we, when we think about America in a troubled world uh, and, and what does our future hold, I believe there's going to be a lot of Americans who are in heaven standing and then bowing before the throne of God, worshiping Jesus Christ. And it is our heart, our mission, each one of us, to make sure that nobody gets left behind, as it were, that nobody ha misses that opportunity to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. We can't be responsible for convincing people. We can be responsible, and we are responsible, for sharing the gospel so that every, uh, everyone has that chance to, to be part of 
Revelation chapter 7. So that is a positive. Uh, that's the United States among every nation being referenced positively in uh, last day's scriptures. Now, Matthew chapter 24. Turn back with me uh, to Matthew chapter 24, and let's look at verse 14. Now, there's a lot of things that happen in Matthew 24, this list uh, that Jesus gives. You know, he's asked this question by the disciples, hey, when, when are you coming back, and what's the sign? They're just asking for one that would indicate that you're getting close to coming back. So, you know, we, we can be ready. Uh, they had no idea how long, you know, it would be. Uh, but Jesus could have given a very Washington political answer. No comment. Next question. But he didn't. He actually answers the question and gives a list of signs, not just one. And, you know, a lot of them are bad, right? Uh, but, but there's a positive one. Chapter 24, verse 14 of Matthew. This gospel, this good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again to forgive our sins and, and adopt us into God's family, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Again, I think it, it's fair because we're talking about the whole world and all nations uh, that not only, that, that, that this country will hear, that everyone will have a chance to hear. Now, we probably are pretty close to that anyway. Uh, got, only God can assess at any given moment if everyone in our country has heard. But we certainly have more opportunities to share the gospel uh, than any other uh, country in terms of technology and freedom and so forth. But not only that, I think the United States is, is fairly, uh, I think it's fair to reference the United States in this as being one of the countries that God is using to drive the gospel from this building, from this city. Think of how much has gone out around the world, around uh, uh, the, uh, every nation, the gospel of Jesus Christ because of what has happened through the life of Dwight L. Moody alone. To speak nothing of uh, Youth for Christ being in Chicago and Billy Graham and all the other ministries that have come out of this city. God is using the United States powerfully to proclaim the gospel all over the world. Uh, this is a country that, we're, that is recruiting and training missionaries. A country that's funding uh, ministries around the world. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you think of it, it's the ATM machine of, of the world missions movement. Uh, you know, and then, uh, and then there's the internet and satellite, well, internet, thank God for Al Gore, right? Because <laughs> what if he hadn't invented the internet? You know, I mean, so uh, the internet, satellite television technology, radio technology, obviously God has used this country and continues to use it. And we should be grateful. We should be grateful and we should be prayerful that the Lord is merciful and allows us to continue to be a country smack dab in the middle of Matthew 24, 14, uh, to helping fulfill that verse. Because only then, when everyone on the planet has had a chance to see and hear and understand, process and make a decision about Jesus Christ, then Jesus come, will come back. So those are two uh, of the positive references. Now, you know, we have to look at the, the, the flip side as well. Uh, turn, well, let, staying here in Matthew 24 for a moment, uh, the, there are going to be events that are happening all over the world that will be negative. Wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We've had two world wars in the last century, and the United States was at the center of both. Think of the, uh, the persecution uh, that has gone on around the world. There is, I wouldn't call persecution here in the United States. There's harassment, there's annoyance. We haven't, we're not suffering persecution like they do in Saudi, like they do in Iran or Sudan or other, or China, right? But look at the lawlessness. Look at the betrayals. Look at people's love growing cold for one another. I mean, look at what is happening in our culture. I don't have to convince you of how many of these negative signs that we would expect to happen in the last days are certainly happening in our country. Not ours alone, but we have to be sober about this, and I know that you are. Think then of, uh, uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writing to his young disciple, who's of course pastoring a church in Ephesus, 
And, and Paul, looking down the corridors of time, speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit, says this. But realize this, Timothy, he's talking to, and then through to us, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, re reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And he wasn't only referring to Congress. I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> this isn't, these are national epidemics, right? I mean, this is not, you know, I've been in Washington 20 years now, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I grew up in upstate New York. I left Love Canal <laughs> to go to the toxic, you know, environment of Washington, D.C. But, but these things are not limited to, you know, our capital and our political class. This is America, sadly. It's not all of America, but this is what we battle against, right? Holding to a form of godliness, although denying its power. This is the world that we live in. This is the country that we, we love, but not because of these things. This is, we are watching the erosion of the church, the erosion of uh, Judeo-Christian values and virtues. We are, we are losing the culture. Now, the Bible says that we won't be alone, that this will be a, a worldwide epidemic, these things. And to be fair, we have to assess ourselves and say, when we think of America in a troubled world, what does the future hold? These are likely to get worse. Our job is to be salt. Our job is to be light. Our job is not to give up, not to fear, right? John chapter 14, uh, you know, Jesus said, let your heart not be troubled. I, I know you think that Sean Hannity came up with that, but that, you know, that is actually scripture. We're not supposed to be afraid. We're not supposed to be worried, oh, the Muslims are going to take over everything. Oh my gosh, the, you know, the ACLU is going to destroy everything. Whatever your angle is, and, and you may not be wrong about these things, but the point is, we're not supposed to be afraid. We're not supposed to be on defense. Lovingly, confidently, boldly, courageously, we're supposed to be engaging our culture. Or we're going to lose it. And we're in danger of losing it now. But there are no specific references to the United States in Scripture that I can find. I know people have referred to various times and places, well, what about this eagle and what about that? I don't see it. Just from my own vantage point, I don't see the United States clearly in Scripture. Not obviously by name, but even countries that are not named by names that we would use today are referenced. And territories and regions are mentioned in the Bible. I don't see that when it comes to the United States. Europe is mentioned. Uh, when we look at Daniel chapter 9, when you look at Ezekiel 38, you see in, in Daniel 9 the rise of Rome, the rise of a European empire with an antichrist coming out of the very peoples that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Europe is going to be at the heart of the end times. And what have we seen? Yes, two world wars in Europe in the last century. And now the unification. Uh, no, uh, not uh, divided currencies, one currency. Border, borderless crossings, one passport. This year, or this past year, uh, the first president of the European Union was established. We don't even know his name. I mean, it, it's, to be, it's known, but I'm saying it's not somebody that we even think of or pay attention to yet. But, that, but the, the very things that the Bible uh, describes as, as a re-emergent Europe, powerful, strong, unified, that's happening. And, and the Bible refers to Europe in the scriptures. And Turkey is mentioned in, uh, as referred to in Ezekiel 38. We'll, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Asia is mentioned in the scriptures, right? Uh, in Revelation 16, verse 12, we learn about the kings of the east. Now, the Bible doesn't refer specifically to China or North Korea or Indonesia or India or Pakistan. We don't know which kings of the East, but at least a territory, a region uh, is referenced. And, you know, that's interesting. It's useful that somehow uh, Eastern powers are going to be coming into Iraq, heading towards Israel at the end of days. Africa is mentioned in the scriptures. 
Isaiah 19 describes how Egypt will be judged by the Lord, but then he will pour out his spirit on the Egyptians, and they will come to Christ in huge numbers and, and form uh, a spiritual alliance with uh, Syrian believers and Israeli believers. In Ezekiel chapter 38, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but Sudan is referred to, Libya is referred to, Ethiopia is referred to, Algeria is referred to, possibly Tunisia. That, those regions of North Africa and then sort of the uh, uh, east, uh, the, the northeast uh, quadrant, uh, it doesn't refer to southern, in, uh, southern Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in, in, in any detail, but Africa is referenced. Obviously, the Middle East is indicated as the epicenter. I mean, Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5, five uh, God says the, he set Jerusalem at the center of the nations and put all the nations around her. So geographically, from God's perspective, Israel is the center, the epicenter of the world. Jerusalem is the epicenter of Israel, and the Temple Mount is the epicenter of Jerusalem. But of course, as you go through the scriptures, you see that uh, in Ezekiel 36 and 37, 38 and 39, Israel is reborn as a country in the last days. In Revelation, the, the last country ever mentioned in the Bible is Israel. The last city ever mentioned in the Bible is Jerusalem. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the Quran? Zero. It's mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible, and it's the last country. It's the last city mentioned. You think, you know, how could Israel be the last country ever mentioned in the Bible and a major focal point of, of all the kings of the earth, all the nations of the earth, when for 1,900 years Israel didn't even exist? I mean, this is one of the things that people are like, you know, you don't actually believe the Bible. You don't take it seriously, do you? You don't take it literally, do you? You don't actually believe Israel will be the focal point of all human attention at the end of time. It doesn't even exist. The Jews are scattered all over the world. They're not coming back, brother. I'm not, and this is not, this was said for 1,900 years, and it wasn't just said by pagans. It was said by the church. You know, and, and, and look, I have compassion and, and sympathy for replacement theologians pre-1948, and I'll tell you why. I'm not kidding. I mean, you know, 500 years go by after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in, in 70 AD. You know, 500 years go by, and you think, Okay, when is Ezekiel's prophecies kind of come true and Israel will re be reborn and Jews will come back and rebuild the ancient ruins and make the desert bloom? And, you know, uh, 500 years go by, nothing. 800 years go by, nothing. A thousand years go by, nothing. People start saying, you know, maybe we're reading that wrong. No, 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 no. Literalists would say, no, 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 it, it's true. It's just, it's just taking time, you know. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Just hang in there. 1,200 years go by, 1,400 years go by, 1,600 years go by. No Israel, no Jewish return, no deserts blooming. People are like, look, you know, brothers, you know, you know, the people, replacement theologians are now saying to their, their you know, literalist uh, brothers saying, are you really holding on to that? Because really, it ain't going to happen. We're, we're all misreading it. It's metaphoric. It's symbolic. When you see Israel, just flip it in your mind. It means church. 1,600 years, 1,700 years, 1,800 years go by, 1,900 years go by. People are like, all right, that's it. I mean, the last literalists are like, <laughs> not actually. By the time you get to the mid-1800s and the early 1900s, uh, uh, something is changing. There's a sense that something is going to happen, and there's, a, there's discussion in the Jewish world. There's discussion in the Christian world. No, Israel is coming back. I, we don't know how. We don't know when. It seems impossible. Then, you know, the Bible talks about, can, it, can a nation be born in a day? Apparently it can. May 14th, 1948. So when, when replacement theologians today look back in the centuries and say, well, this church father said that in, you know, 900, and this church father said it in 1300, Look, I understand that. It, it seemed impossible from their vantage point. I, I, I'm sympathetic with that. But we, we know now that Israel and Iraq, Iraq it becomes a huge force in the last days, right? And it, it, by, by the time you get to Revelation 18, 19, you're talking about uh, Iraq, is, uh, Babylon is the most 
the wealthiest country, the wealthiest, most powerful city on the face of the planet in the history of mankind. All the merchants of the earth are watching as it's destroyed. But before it can be destroyed, it has to rise again. I'm hoping that our friend Charlie Dyer, who probably is the only person in the room who has been to, Iraq, uh, to Babylon, I hope he delves into that a little bit tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it. And I have to tell you, I, I've been talking to him and a friend of ours about praying about, could we go to Babylon? Could I take a film crew and just start to walk? That city is rising as we speak. I don't want to steal his thunder. But, it's, but this is the focus. It, the Israel, Iraq, these countries are going to be the, are the epicenter of man's focus in the last days. Why? Because they're the epicenter of God's focus and Satan's. Okay, so all these regions and countries and territories are mentioned, not the United States. Now, it's conspicuous in its absence, because if you believe, as I do, that we are living in the last days. And, you know, I mean, Peter uh, was saying it was the last days 2,000 years ago. The Apostle John said it was the last hour. It's above my pay grade. Why? He said, I don't understand that, but... I don't understand. You know, okay. But if, if we were living the last days and the last hour 2,000 years ago, are we in the last micro milliseconds? I mean, right? I mean, that's important to know. But the United States is, is conspicuous in our absence in the text. You don't see the kings of the West coming in to do anything, really. So there's not, there's not a, a reference like that. So people often ask me, this is the number one question that I get asked when I travel around the country and around the world. I probably get asked it more outside the United States and in, but, but a lot in the inside. And people say, Joel, well, the two most often questions, one is, how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? And uh, the second one is, what happens to the United States? Aren't we in end times prophecy? And I don't see it. So the question is, what people are really asking is, Joel, if, if you're right that we're living in the last days right now, and the United States is the wealthiest, most powerful country on the face of the planet in the history of mankind, why are we not a, a, a player? Why are we not a game changer, a significant factor, or even a footnote in the events of the last days? Aside from, uh, you know, references like, you know, the gospel being preached to the whole world and us thinking, well, the United States is being used by God like that. But in terms of some direct reference, how is that possible? How, what happens to us? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because the text doesn't tell us. And I, it's very important, I, 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 I urge you, any of you that write about, think about, teach about, think about, have conversations about Bible prophecy. Please, we, we need to be careful. If the text doesn't tell us, let's just tell people. We, I don't know. That's an important phrase. In fact, maybe we could all say it once. On the count of three. One, two, three. I don't know. When you talk about Bible prophecy, there's a temptation to think, people think I know a lot about prophecy, so I'm just going to say, yeah, absolutely, I know that. Yes, thank you, sir. Appreciate the question. I've, of course, got the best answer in the world. You know, that you got to be, we have to be careful. If the text tells us, great. We, we teach what the text tells us. If we don't, if the text doesn't tell us, God didn't want us to know yet. So we can, we can speculate, but we have to be clear that's what we're doing. Okay, so that's what I'm about to do. I don't know what happened to the United States. But here's some possibilities. Financial collapse. The United States implodes economically. It's interesting, uh, just a few weeks ago, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, was asked uh, during a forum, what's the number one security threat that we face as the United States? And you know, you might have expected him to say Al-Qaeda or Iran's nuclear program or what have you. He said the number one threat to the United States is our debt. He's absolutely right, and I don't think that needs a lot of elaboration at this moment. We are, we are drowning, and, and it seems difficult to imagine how anybody could fix it. God could do it, but right now we are, we are drowning, and uh, it's hard to see a way forward. So that's one possibility. Not that the United States doesn't exist as we move deeper into the last days, but that we're incapacitated, that we're unable 
to engage in the events of the last days uh, uh, militarily or any other way because we, 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 don't, we can't afford it. A second possibility would be a decapitating terrorist attack, something that took out our national government and made it impossible for us to make decisions at a moment where other world leaders were beginning to move. Another possibility, of course, would be a biological, chemical, or nuclear attack on our country, any part of our country, but in particular the major economic, military, and political centers of our national life that would just render us uh, incapable of making uh, decisions and projecting force outward. Obviously, one of the scenarios would be natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, uh, all kinds of other natural disasters, which the Bible says to expect uh, major earthquakes and natural disasters in the last days. Uh, think of uh, sort of Hurricane Katrina uh, multiple times, week after week, week after week, week after week, in different parts of the country as just one scenario, how hard it was to respond just to that. Another possibility of what happens to us, which, which makes us incapable of responding and engaging in world events, particularly in the epicenter in the last days, would of course be the rapture. You know, think of how uh, our economy and our national life was affected when we lost nearly 3,000 Americans on September 11th, 2001. Imagine losing 20 million believers in a blink of an eye, or 50, or 60, or 100 million. I, I don't want to be the, I can't be the, the arbiter of who God has decided, yes, has in fact received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, but let's say it's 100 million people, one in three. You think you've got a foreclosure problem now. <laughs> you know, it, 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 the country would be incapacitated. You can't recover. And you certainly couldn't recover rapidly. The other possibility, and, there, and there's many others, I'll just mention one other for tonight, and that would be uh, a weak leadership that squanders our global influence and our moral authority or becomes isolationist or reclusive. This is another threat. It's not that we, all these others are about the, the United States being in, um, unable to project force and engage in the events of the last days. This would be an unwillingness to do so. So that's sobering. Uh, I don't know which or any of these are, things are going to happen in what order. I mean, you know, one of them I do believe uh, the rapture will happen. Uh, don't ask me when. I, this, this is the part I don't, I can't answer. But um, the rest of these yeah, all seem like likely possibilities. I don't want to say they're probabilities, but you make the call. You assess it. You need to analyze these present times. Yeah, okay, turn on, you know, what, you know, WGN and check out the 10 minutes of Doppler weather, radar, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, honestly, you, you know, all the millions of dollars that are spent on weather forecasting, not just in Chicago, but all the different places that you live. I mean, shouldn't they basically just say, look, tomorrow will be a mixture of clouds and sunshine with a 40% chance of precipitation. That's not being overly pessimistic. It could go either way. Uh, that would basically cover it, right? Do you really know? I mean, I, I'm telling my boys, I, my, you know, our oldest, Caleb, is 16. I think, I say, look, if you're not entirely sure what you want to do with your life, become a weatherman. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. You'll have a job. People know you don't really know, and they don't, but they watch anyway. He hasn't quite accepted that idea, but I'm telling them, yeah, it's worth thinking about. Look, we spend a lot of time thinking about what tomorrow's weather will, 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 will be when we don't really know. Are we analyzing the world that we live in, the, the, the trajectory of events, positive and negative, and, and where the United States fits in it, and how these different factors will, could in, would entirely change our lives? Now, in that context, I want to look at a, a scriptural example of, of, of a major end times prophecy in which the United States leadership is completely absent. And because it, it's, it's instructive to see, not just learn the prophecy in its own right, but to understand what the world looks like when the United States either isn't able or isn't willing to engage. And if you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 38, I'd like to walk us through these prophecies. In the meantime, I forgot to bring up a, that bottle of water, so one second. Ezekiel 
Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. We'll go through uh, some key uh, uh, passages, and we'll, we'll try to analyze this and get a sense of the troubled world that we are in and the troubled world that we're heading towards uh, and what the future holds. How soon? I can't tell you. But let's, let's, let's give us an assessment. And the word of the Lord came to me, the prophet Ezekiel, writing 2,600 years ago, wrote, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Okay, let's just TiVo that for one second. Often when I speak, although I suspect a lot of you are more learned in these things uh, than, than, a, than a general audience that I might be speaking to, but just, you know, for the video or for somebody who might be new to this discussion, often people say to me, okay, 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 hold on, Rosenberg. Gog, what is, I'm just a Gog thinking about it. What in the world are you talking about here, son? So Gog is not a, a name. It's not a a personal name like Fred Gog or Dimitri Gog or Ahmed Gog or Joel Gog. Uh, no, it's a title like a pharaoh or a czar. It's, he, he's a leader. He's described as, the, as a prince of a territory. He's uh, described in the, chapter, in the verses ahead as a, a diplomatic leader, an alliance builder, a coalition builder. He's described as a military leader. He's building an alliance, uh, not just of uh, national political leaders, but of military forces uh, uh, determined to achieve an objective. Uh, in chapter, uh, verse 10, uh, it's, he, Gog is described as uh, devising an evil plan or an evil scheme. This is clearly one of the Bible bad guys, okay? So, uh, so this, this leader comes from this territory called Magog. And most people say, that's not helping me any. Yeah, I understand. Now, in my book, Epicenter, I break down these ancient names. Uh, most of them refer to uh, nations, uh, people groups, uh, that are referred to in Genesis chapter 10, what's called the Table of Nations. These are descendants of Noah, who spread out after the flood and moved to these different parts of the world and settled there. This is interesting to me because uh, in a moment we'll see that these events happen in the last days. That's what Ezekiel says. In the last days these events will happen. And these are descendants of Noah. This is what ties together with Jesus saying in Matthew 24 that he's not coming back again until the days of Noah. And since our little Noah's around, again, I just want to reinforce to you that if you remember nothing else, remember you're living in the days of Noah. Now, if you, in my book, I break down uh, the historical detective work that you need to do to try to discern and decipher what these ancient names refer to. But when you do the homework, and I, and I won't go through all those details tonight, but when you do that homework, you come to the conclusion, I did, and I think it's a compelling case, uh, that you're talking about Russia and the former Soviet republics. Uh, we know that the Magogites, uh, the Flavius Josephus tells us 2,000 years ago in his famous book, The Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus wrote that the Magogites are the people whom the Greeks called Scythians. Now the Scythians we know historically moved from the Middle East as a people group and they settled north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea in what we now call Russia and the former Soviet Republic. So that's just one uh, piece of evidence uh, the, um, among many. There's another one that I will mention because it's in the text. Uh, if you look at uh, Ezekiel, uh, let's see, uh, 38 verse 15, it's talking about Gog and his forces will eventually come from the remotest parts of the north. Uh, if you look down in chapter 39 verse 2, it says Gog will come from the remotest parts of the north against the mountains of Israel. Uh, others will say from the farthermost parts of the north. Well, if you take a map and you look at Israel and you go due north as far north as you can possibly go, where are you? You're in Russia. Uh, if you go any further north, you're going south and you're in Canada. So my Canadian friends are very happy that that's south. That can't be 
you know, the, the territory of Magog, okay? So, so uh, th th those are a few of the examples, and there are uh, uh, numerous others that I write about in the book. You can get it from the library. I'm not pitching it. I'm just saying if it's useful to you. Now, what's going to happen is this, this leader of Russia, this dictator, this evil leader, is going to emerge. Now, he's going to build this military, political, economic alliance with a group of countries to come against the mountains of Israel, to come against the people of Israel. These countries are mentioned. In verse 5, we see the first nation mentioned as an ally of Russia will be Persia. Well, that's an easy one to decipher because until 1935, Persia was the official legal name of the country that we now know as Iran. Now, any of you that have been tracking events in recent years will know that Russia and Iran haven't had an alliance in 25, 26 hundred years since Ezekiel wrote that until the last decade or so. And it's accelerated at a point where this Iranian nuclear reactor in Boucher, right on the Persian Gulf, the one that has now been delayed because a mysterious uh, computer virus uh, seems to have wormed its way into the computer systems and has slowed down the ability of this Russian-built, Russian-engineered, uh, Russian-established uh, nuclear reactor to enrich uranium for the Iranians who the, even the IAEA uh, the UN Nuclear Watchdog Agency says is heading towards building nuclear weapons. The Russians are building this system, and, 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 and yet uh, this is just one more of many examples of how Russia and Iran have formed an alliance that they have never had in human history. The next country mentioned uh, in your Bibles, might, it might say Ethiopia, but the Hebrew word there is Kush which refers to the Upper Nile region, which in the geography of, the, of Africa means south of Egypt in what we, now know in, know, what we now know mostly as Sudan, though it may also involve uh, Ethiopia. Uh, Sudan is really the heart of the territory that's, that's Kush, and Sudan is a country that has a very close alliance right now with Russia and Iran. In fact, when a few years ago, when uh, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, decided, I'm, where would I give a speech to call the, uh, the, Iran uh, the Israelis uh, sons of Satan? Oh, I I'll go to Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. Perfect. And, and that's where he gave that speech. And, you know, it's interesting because Iran and Sudan have a very close uh, strategic military terrorist relationship today. But historically, that was not the case. Uh, the Iranians are Persians, ethnically. Uh, the uh, Sudanese are uh, Arabs and, and, and Africans. Uh, Sunnis, uh, the Sudanese are Sunnis, uh, those who are Muslims, and the Iranians are Shias. So just, a f you know, and geographically, they're separated uh, by the entire Arabian Peninsula. This is not two countries, historically, you would have sat next to each other in the Bible and say, yeah, they're going to be a key strategic military alliance uh, tied in with Russia against Israel in the end of days. But that's where we are today. Now, do any of these things so far give us conclusive evidence that these events of uh, what's known as the War of Gog and Magog, that they're going to happen in our lifetime? Is it conclusive? No, it's not conclusive. It's curious, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and let's continue analyzing it. The next nation mentioned is Put. Now, where do we put Put? Uh, Josephus tells us that Put is ancient Libyos, what we now know as the modern state of Libya, though ancient Libyos was a larger geographic territory than current modern-day Libya. So it also seems to include Algeria and possibly Tunisia. Doesn't seem to extend as far as Morocco. And uh, absent from this text, both in Ezekiel 38 and 39, absent from this text, is any evidence of Iraq or any evidence of Egypt. Now, those two are interesting in their absence because, you know, Israel has been at war or, and, and hostile with Egypt and vice versa, going back to Charlton Heston taking on Yul Brenner. I mean, this is, goes way back. You know, and who was leading the charge against the, the nation state of Israel in 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973? Egypt. Prior to 1973, I would say prior to 1979, when Egypt signed a historic peace treaty with Israel at Camp David, uh, this, this prophecy couldn't have happened. 
because Egypt would have been at the front of the line to attack Israel at any other point historically prior to this. Iraq is not mentioned in this list. Iraq, I mean, when, when, Sudan, when Saddam Hussein was in, in, in power, he, had, he not only uh, attacked Israel, he fired 39 Scud missiles uh, at Israel in the 1991 Gulf War. I mean, he threatened to destroy half of Israel with chemical weapons. Saddam Hussein hated the Israelis and made it obviously very clear and attacked them when he could. He, Saddam Hussein used to pay uh, Palestinian families $25,000 if they would send their children to become suicide bombers and kill Israelis. So Saddam Hussein couldn't have been on the planet for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to happen. And now he's not. We're, an interesting, we're in an interesting window where Egypt has a treaty with Israel and even a working relationship. Uh, Hosni Mubarak, the, the president of Egypt, uh, has an actually relatively reasonable working relationship with my old boss, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I, I, you know, I worked for him 10 years ago on his comeback campaign. Didn't help him go anywhere, so I'm, I don't want to overstate my role with him, but I'm just saying Netanyahu and Mubarak are working quite closely right now on the peace process with the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's interesting. And, and, and the Iraqis uh, have a rudimentary uh, democracy. I've been to Iraq four times in recent years, and it's gotten more peaceful, more prosperous, more stable every time I've gone. How long will that last? We know from a revelation that Iraq emerges into be the global evil superpower. But we're in a window where they, are not, they have no ability to pro project force outside their borders. How long will that window last where Egypt has a treaty with Israel and Iraq is not a factor because neither of them ha engage in this, in this battle? And look, it's not like God said, oh gosh, I totally forgot to put Egypt in there. Or Iraq, oh my gosh. Now Iraq, of course, is never mentioned in the Bible. It's Babylon, Babylonia, Babel, Mesopotamia, uh, you know, uh, Shinar. I mean, there's all kinds of Chaldea. There's all kinds of Bible names for Iraq. God doesn't use any of them. And that's noteworthy. It's not conclusive that these things are about to happen imminently, but it's, it's certainly curious. Now, the next country uh, people group mentioned there in verse 6 is Gomer. Now, this is not where Gomer Pyle is from. This actually is Turkey. Now, this is interesting because when I wrote Epicenter in 2006, or it was released in 2006, uh, you know, people said to me, you know, Joel, the idea that Turkey is going to be an ally with Russia and Iran and engage hostily against Israel is, is, challenge, is, is hard to imagine. Yes, Turkey was the, the head of the caliphate, the Islamic empire under the Ottomans, but you know, they're a NATO ally. They're an ally of the United States. They're, an, they're a friend of Israel. Th tens of thousands of Israelis flock to Turkish resorts every year for cheap and beautiful vacations. That's true. But I said, yeah, I don't know when Turkey's going to turn, but that's what the Bible says will happen at some point. And what a year to 18 months it has been. When I was uh, growing up, my father loved to sail. And uh, he used to teach me when we would go out on the lake and, and sailing on his, uh, his uh, beautiful uh, wooden sailboat, he said, now, son, you have to be careful because when the winds shift, you have to duck because that boom is going to come sweeping across uh, the deck and it'll come really, really quickly. And if you're not paying attention, you'll have your head knocked clean off or you'll be knocked out of the boat or both. You've got to pay attention when the winds are shifting. The winds are shifting. Turkey has made its decision, in, in my assessment, that at least under the current leadership, it could go back if the leadership changes. But as of now, this leadership has decided the European Union has rejected our request for membership and we have no future with the West, we're going East. And to reestablish street cred, credibility with the radical Muslim world that they now have to tie to, in their view, because Europe has rejected them, it's, it's causing them to take highly provocative actions against Israel. It's also happening, since it doesn't have any uh, uh, natural gas or energy resources to, to speak of, it is tying in with Russia and Iran in ever-increasing 
quantities and, uh, and amounts. It's really quite striking what has happened with Gomer, with Turkey, just in the last 12 to 18 months. It's not conclusive that these things are all about to happen, but it's curious. Now, uh, the next one is Beth Togarma. These are the Turkic-speaking peoples that sort of spread out across the Caucasus, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, and throughout the Central Asian region. We don't know exactly every precise territory that might be included, but it's certainly that Central Asian and Caucasus region. Now, you look at the uh, countries that Ezekiel told us 2,500 plus years ago would be aligned with Russia in the end of days, and you look at what's happening now, and it's intriguing to me. And then what you see is, uh, in verse 8, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping 7, I'm going to come back to 7. But in verse 8 it says, in the latter years, you, he's speaking to, God is speaking to Gog, God is speaking to Gog, in the latter years you will come into the land that was restored from the sword, from inhabitants who have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but its people were brought out from the nations, and they're living securely, uh, all of them. This is interesting. It means that one, there are several prerequisites to Ezekiel 38 and 39, 39 playing out. One of them is Israel has to be reborn as a country. That's what Ezekiel 36 and 37 are all about. The Jews have to be back in the land. They have to be rebuilding the ancient ruins. All, all the things that Ezekiel 36 and 37 say will happen in the last days have to have happened for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to come true. Moreover, not only uh, does Israel just come back as a country uh, and the, the valley of the dry bones, you know, all comes back together again and everything. Uh, Moreover, Israelis have to, be, have to feel like they're living securely. Now, it never actually says there will be a peace treaty. It doesn't use that terminology. But somehow, Israelis have to feel like they're living secure. Now, that's interesting, because those of us who live in the West often look at Israel and go, you know, Iran is threatening to wipe them off the face of the planet, and Hezbollah is building up, you know, 40, 50,000 missiles, and Hamas has its, you know, suicide bombers and rockets and missiles, and it looks bleak. And often when I take uh, tours of Isra uh, people over to Israel, uh, I start, you know, we had almost 300 people last November, and I said, why are all you people here? Aren't you reading what I'm telling you? You know, this, Israel's endangered. That's true. But it's a conundrum. Yes, Israel is threatened at one level, but Israelis see it as they are more secure today than any other time in the 62 years that they've been around. They have a treaty with Egypt. They have a treaty with Jordan. Yasser Arafat is gone. Saddam Hussein is gone. The United States is engaged in the region currently. Israel has the best air force in the region. It has a missile defense. It has nuclear weapons, off the record. Uh, it, it, it has a, a, the strongest economy in the world right now, maybe aside from China, certainly in the Western world. It's growing faster than any country in the West. So from the Israeli perspective, they're like, yeah, yeah, we get it. People hate us. They want to annihilate us, yada, yada, yada. I mean, not, they're not saying yada, 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 but, I mean, but it's not like, this is not new to them. What's new to them is in the context of people hating them and wanting to kill them and annihilate them, things are actually pretty good. Lynn and the boys and I were over in Israel for two weeks uh, late this summer, and, you know, the beaches are full, and the malls are full, and, and the economy is growing. It's not good for everybody in Israel. 25% of Israelis live under the poverty level. Uh, the country's preparing uh, for a major war, but at the same time, the, moment to moment, things feel calm, and, and, and these, in the grand scheme of Israeli uh, modern life, Israelis are living more secure today than any other time. Now, does that check off that prerequisite in God's economy? I, I don't know yet. Maybe we're about to see a major breakthrough between Netanyahu and Abu Mazen. Maybe there's going to be a dramatic uh, peace accord. It, I, I can see that it's hard for me to picture, but Netanyahu seems to believe it's possible. I like him. I, I don't think he's, every decision he's always made has been a good one, but I'm praying for him. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus, uh, the, the psalmist told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, with all deference to my brother Tassada, uh, I, I want to make it clear that 
Psalm 122.6 is not the Arafat translation. It's not pray for a piece of Jerusalem, then kill all the Jews and Christians, and then take it all over for yourself. Uh, the psalmist says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let us not be cynical as followers of Jesus Christ. Let us not say, oh, the peace process will never do anything. I mean, we can be realistic and, and assess that it's going to be difficult. And maybe God's not going to allow it to happen. Maybe Satan's going to try to stop it from happening. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of things. But, let's, but Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. We need to try. We, need to, we can't just give up. There are lives at stake. And maybe we're about to see a dramatic breakthrough that would be so dramatic that uh, the wall between and the, and the security fence between the Israelis and the Palestinians would start coming down. I, I'm not here to predict that tonight, but maybe God intends this to be even more secure. But it's certainly more secure today than any time in 62 years. And I think it's, we have to consider the possibility that maybe God is ready to check this off his list. It's not conclusive, but it's definitely curious. Now, there's a lot of other pieces here. Uh, for tonight, I want to just uh, begin to uh, tie this together and help you understand uh, uh, the end of 38 and then understand the implications of 39. It's very, very important uh, in our opening evening. In verse 15, it talks about how God says, you, Gog, will come out of your place in the remote parts of, your nor of the north. Uh, now, in verse 16, it talks about this will happen in the last days. Okay, there's a time reference uh, saying this is not something that's happened in the past. This is something that's coming. It's future. It's going to happen in these last days. Now, verse 18, again, just for time's sake tonight, it will come about on that day when Gog, the Russian dictator, comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will be surely a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse. Every wall will fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against him, against Gog and his forces, on my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence, with diseases, and, and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. And I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. You see, what the Lord describes here is the most dramatic, and we should note horrific, day in the history of human civilization to that point. The events of Revelation and the Tribulation will be actually far worse. But to this, to this particular moment, when it happens, this will be the most dramatic and horrifying moment in all of human history. Fire will literally be falling from heaven on the enemy forces that try to attack Israel. Now, let me be clear, and you're going to see it in verse 39, we, 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 chapter 39. Yes, God will intervene and protect Israel. But we have, we have to be careful not to only have love and compassion on Israel. Do you see what's going to happen? People are going to suffer. People are going to die. And not everyone will be purposely trying to engage in a war against Israel. There will be millions of people caught in the crossfire of a war they don't want, a war they can't stop. And we know from John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the entire world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever... A Netanyahu advisor like me or a Yasser Arafat advisor like Tassad, whoever believes in him, in Jesus Christ, shall not perish, die and go to hell forever and ever and ever and ever with no way of escape, but shall have eternal life. Jesus Christ loves the Palestinians. He loves the Syrians. He loves the Lebanese. He loves the Egyptians. He loves the Iraqis. He loves the Iranians. He loves the Russians and the Turks and the Sudanese and everybody in the world and everyone in that region. And we dare not look at this and say, good, a pox on your house. 
This is not the appropriate interpretation. Jesus told us to love our neighbors. Where did he say that? Standing in Israel. Who were the neighbors? <laughs> Right? I mean, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you say, well, they're not neighbors, they're enemies. Okay, then Jesus said, love your enemies. Ah, Newman, you know. <laughs> Seemed to cover everything. This is not, this is going to happen, and this is going to be tragic. Yes, it's going to be great for Israel. Yes, it's going to be a dramatic moment when God reaches his hand into human history and says, remember when I said in Genesis 12 that those who bless Israel I will bless, and those who curse Israel I will curse? This is what I was talking about. I'm paraphrasing. You know, I'm, I'm, but I'm saying, that yes, it will be good for Israel, but this is a horrible, bloody day. When you go through, and I encourage you to do it, Ezekiel chapter 39, what you're going to find is so many people have died that it takes seven months to bury all the bodies. And it would take longer, except the Bible tells us that the birds of the air and the beasts of the field eat many of the bodies. There is going to be so much destruction, so much chaos and carnage. There, it, the Bible also indicates that there will be an earthquake in the land of Israel. Now, does that mean every, every wall in Israel will, be, will fall? Or does it mean just every wall in the neighboring areas will fall. It will be, the, the effect of it will be worldwide. I, I can't tell you. I can't parse that all out, but I'm telling you, Jesus came to die for Jews, but he also came to die for Palestinians. He, Jesus came to die for everybody, and he came and told us that, that we should pre preach the gospel starting in Jerusalem and then Judea, and then Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Now, Judea and Samaria, you probably don't even use this term now, but this is what the world calls the West Bank. Okay? All those settlements that are in the news, that's Judea and Samaria. And Jesus told us to take the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Why? Well, first and foremost, because he told us to do it. Second, because People need, you know, people are going to hell uh, without the gospel. Here in Chicago and, and, and certainly in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, everywhere in the world that's true. You know that. But also because great trauma is coming. Great tragedy is coming. Great judgment is coming. And people need the gospel first. We are in a window. I can't tell you how long that window will last. We need to be about loving Israel, loving her neighbors, loving her enemies, doing so unconditionally, unwaveringly, with the gospel, with church planting, with discipleship in every possible way, as well as in real and other practical ways, like food and clothing and medical supplies and all kinds of other humanitarian relief. Why? Because Matthew 24 tells us about all the wars and rumors of wars and traumas that are coming in the last days. Matthew 25, in part, Jesus comes back and says, uh, thanks for feeding the hungry. Thanks for clothing the naked. Thanks for giving water to the thirsty. Thank you for visiting the prisoners and caring for the suffering. And followers of Jesus Christ are like, oh, you know, when do we do that for you? If we're truly his followers, if we truly love him, we have to understand that not only do we need to advance the gospel and fulfill Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, everywhere, and particularly in the Middle East, where these traumas and tragedies and horrors are coming, but we also need to touch people's lives in, in, in daily, real, and loving and practical ways. And not with strings attached. When I say unconditional love, I mean unconditional. Meaning, you, you, we can't say, oh, I'll give you a piece of bread, but you got to believe in Jesus first. You know, when Jesus was, was feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000, actually it was 5,000 men, it was women and children. The, the fact that women and children showed up to hear Jesus teach wasn't significant, apparently uh, noteworthy in the Bible. The fact that 5,000 men showed up to hear the Word of God, that was interesting for the writers of the scriptures. But anyway, there was many more than those people. But when Jesus fed them miraculously, did he say, hey, listen, if you're going to follow me forever and, and, and understand that I'm the Messiah and give your life to me and make me the Lord of your life, you get in this line, you get your chow. But if you're not planning to follow me forever and you're, you know, have no interest in this, stand in this line, you get bupkis. That's Yiddish for nothing. 
No, that's not how Jesus did it. Jesus loved people and cared for people unconditionally. When he, when he healed the ten lepers, how many, people came, how many of them came back to fall on their faces and worship him as the king of kings and the lord of lords? One. But Jesus healed them anyway, right? Jesus' model for us is not to play bait and switch. He, he teaches us unconditional love. And when we approach these events, these may be decades off, these, this could be months off. I, 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 you know, I'm really not here to tell you. I'm just saying, I, I'm saying, shouldn't we do what Ezekiel 38 verse 7 says? When God says to Gog, the Russian dictator, get ready and be prepared. If God is saying to the enemies of Israel, get ready, be prepared, what should the followers of Jesus Christ be doing? Now, just to tie this together, and you can see there's so much more um, meat and potatoes in, in these verses and in chapter 39, but, but just, to, just to land the plane here, turn uh, to chapter 39, verse 21. Ezekiel tells us, or the Holy Spirit tells us through Ezekiel, God says, I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment which I have executed, and my hand which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know from that, uh, that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. The nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me, and I hid my face from them. So I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword. And according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob. I will have mercy and compassion on the whole house of Israel. I will be jealous for my holy name. They will, then they will forget their disgrace and all their treachery, which they perpetrated against me when they live securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid, when I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I shall be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations, and then I gather them again into their own land, and I will leave none of them there any longer." I will not hide from my face from them any longer, for I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Not only will the events of the war of Gog and Magog be the, the greatest moment of judgment and trauma the world has ever seen to that point, it will also be the beginning of one of the, great, the greatest spiritual awakening in human history to that point. God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on Israel, on the people of the region, and everyone's going to see it. Now, when people see the hand of God, when they see the Holy Spirit moving, people are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Israelis, I believe more Jews will come to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah at this time than at any other time in human history. I believe that more Muslims are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings at this time than at any other time in human history. And we're already seeing more Jews and Muslims come to faith in the last several decades than at any other time in human history. But it's going to get accelerated. And I think we're going to see this worldwide. Now, will everybody come to faith? around the world or in this region at that time? No. Some reject the Holy Spirit's move upon their lives. They, they, they see the truth, but they don't accept it. Judas was one of them. He walked with Jesus for all that time, saw the miracles, couldn't receive it. So we're not talking about everybody getting saved at this moment, but this is going to be dramatic. There's not just bad news in here. There's a lot of good news. Why? Because God uses trouble, financial, economic trouble, uh, natural disasters, and certainly wars and terrorism and rumors of wars and all, to shake us out of our lethargy, out of our cynicism, out of our laziness, out of our sense that any other ideology, religious system, anything else we're thinking of will save us, will give us peace 
God will literally, literally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, politically shake the world. And God is telling the enemies of Israel to get ready. And I'm asking tonight, how are you getting ready? I can't tell you, as I've said it so many times tonight, I can't tell you when these events are going to happen. I can't tell you if this happens before the rapture or after. I, I, there are pieces we don't know because the Lord didn't tell us. What he told us is to get ready, to be prepared, to make sure everyone in the epicenter, man, woman, child, hears the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly in their language, from their people, in the power of the Holy Spirit. The time is short. The work is enormous. Great fruit is happening, but it's not nearly enough when you look at what's coming. And the next war might not even be this prophetic war. It might just be a really, really bad geopolitical war. How many people will die and go to hell forever and ever because we did nothing? And not just the gospel in proclamation. We need to show the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone in this region. We need to feed the poor. We need to care for the suffering. We need to visit prisoners. It's not enough just to proclaim, though it's not enough just to feed and care for prisoners and, and, and the suffering. It, it's, it's the whole gospel for the whole world, right? This is the moment. This is the moment. Yes, America doesn't show up in these texts. You know, you will look in vain in these texts for any evidence of the United States coming to Israel's rescue. Until the last several years, and I'm not making this as a political point, I'm just as an observation, up until the last several years, it would have been hard to imagine the United States not responding militarily to defend Israel in a situation like this. But I think it's beginning to become more conceptually possible that the United States won't for any of the reasons that I laid out earlier or ones that I haven't thought of or mentioned. The United States doesn't come to Israel's defense. And I think it's important as, as I close out this, this, this opening session tonight to note that our role has, as Americans, I, I'll, so I'll speak for myself, my role in part needs to be to use my democratic uh, freedoms and rights and responsibilities to per try to persuade people in Washington to stand with Israel, to love Israel, and love the Palestinians and try to make peace and to bring justice to that part of the world. Not to choose one side or the other in terms of uh, uh, compassion, but certainly protecting Israel's right to, uh, to have security and national defense while helping Palestinians have the ability to run their own lives day to day without the ability to make alliances that would destroy the nation of Israel. You know, I like what my um, old boss and, uh, and to some degree mentor, Natan Sharansky, says. I want to give every Palestinian every human right possible and protect it for them, except the right to destroy me. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good way to summarize it. So I believe our mission in part, aside from, you know, the gospel and humanitarian relief and all the ways of showing and sharing the love of Jesus Christ in the epicenter, that's the main role of the church. But I think also, as Americans, we should try to persuade our government to do the right thing. To not try to pressure the parties into making disastrous decisions. But we need to remember that God, while we pray for the Lord to change the heart of the king, and he can do it, but the Lord may say no to that answer. Why? Because he may be beginning to wean Israel off of the idol of the United States power. Now, I don't think it's our decision to make. I think if the Lord's going to do the weaning, let him do the weaning. I think we should, I, I believe, we should try to persuade our government, our world leaders, our national leaders, to, you know, keep Genesis 12 in mind. You want to stay on the blessing side of the line, not the cursing side of the line. We've got enough problems with the number one abortion industry in the world and the pornography industry of the world and our financial troubles and, uh, you know, we're, everything's owned by China. Look, we've got enough troubles without throwing our lot against Israel at this moment. 
let's keep in mind not to let our hearts get troubled, not to get weary, not to get frightened when our government might decide to go the other direction. Why? Because God is in control. God is powerful, and God is going to create a scenario or allow a scenario in which no country will come to Israel's defense. Why? So that he can. Why does he wait to the last possible minute? Because he's a thriller writer. <laughs> he has written the number one bestseller of all time. And like the old, uh, you know, cowboy western uh, with, you know, black and white, no sound, you know, when the damsel in distress is on the train track, all tied up, and the train, well, of course you can't hear that, but you can tell it's coming down. And the guy, you know, and the hero is riding and he's taking on all kinds of heat. He's not supposed to get there till the last possible second and pull her off the train track as the train goes rushing through because that's dramatic. God is the author and perfecter of our faith, and he's writing quite a script. And he gave us a, 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 an advanced copy. He gave us a sneak preview of where he's heading. He's not giving us the whole, every detail. He's not throwing the game for us. How will we live differently? How will you live differently in light of what's happening now and what's coming? And as we close, uh, um, I would like us to close in prayer. And then we'll have, actually, we'll have, I think we're going to have a little bit more music, and, and Rich is going to tie things together here. And I appreciate your, your interest and, and your patience through this tonight. But I do want to, for my portion, I'd like to close in prayer, and then we'll have a little bit more as we round off the evening. But let's close in prayer. And let me just say that if you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the first thing you need to do to get ready and be prepared. You need to be ready for eternity. You need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I can't stand in the pulpit at the Moody Church and not give you an invitation, an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. For the scriptures tell us in John 1:12, but as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. He wants to adopt you into his family tonight. And if you are not sure that you've ever made that decision, or you're sure that you haven't, let's close our eyes and bow our heads, and, and, um, and why don't you just raise your hand and let me know that you'd like me to pray with you uh, tonight, and the light's a little strong. So if you'd like to pray, and let's, please, just for privacy's sake, let's just keep our eyes closed and our heads bowed. And if anyone would like me to pray uh, with them, then just raise their hand so I can see it. Okay, I'm going to pray. And if you'd like to pray with me, just pray phrase by phrase in your heart if you're ready. Dear Father, I need you. I've been going my own way, and I'm sorry. I need a Savior tonight, Lord. And I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. And I believe, Father, that you raised Christ from the dead to prove to me that he is the only way to get to you. And Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart tonight by faith. I don't deserve salvation. I know I can't buy it or earn it, but I receive your free gift tonight by faith. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Please forgive me. Please transform me. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. And make me your child tonight. And show me how to walk with you and serve you in these dramatic days. I pray these things in the name of my new Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for anyone that's made that decision and anyone who's processing the rest of this tonight. Lord, I pray you'd bless each person who's come to Moody Church tonight, who's maybe watching on video. Lord, bless them and help them process this. Help us be ready and prepared 
for your return and the events that may happen between now and then. We pray these things in the name of our great Savior and our Lord and our soon coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.